Hello, everyone, and welcome to um, the first of our fall South Talks. Um, South Talks is a series of events um, exploring the interdisciplinary nature of Southern studies, broadly defined. Uh, today, Dr. Megan Rosenthal and I um, will be uh, introducing and uh, facilitating a Q&A for two of our colleagues. Uh, Dr. Rosenthal and I are currently co-directors of the University of Mississippi Community First Research Center for Wellbeing and Creative Achievement, or CREW for short. Um, and in part, we're really, really excited about this particular talk um, because it's gonna focus on community engagement and health, which is near and dear to both of our hearts. Thank you, uh, Dr. Annie Kafer, for that introduction uh, and getting us started. So we are joined today by Dr. Brooke Shield Laurent and Dr. Jennifer Connor. Um, both of these, uh, our colleagues, are from the New York Institute of Technology uh, College of Osteopathic Medicine at Arkansas State University. Um, and they have established the Delta Population Health Institute, also known as DPHI. And this institute is designed to create a culture of health through education, research, policy, engagement, and community engagement. DPHI knows that health starts where we grow, live, learn, work, and play. That's why DPHI is committed to cultivating opportunities for health in families, neighborhoods, schools, and jobs, achieving greater health and equity among all people through Arkansas and the Delta. Dr. Brooke Shield Laurent is an osteopathic family medicine physician. She is a fellow of the AACOM Health Policy Pro uh, Fellowship Program. She's the founding chairwoman of the Department of Clinical Medicine at the New York Institute of, Te Institute of Technology College of Osteopathic Medicine at Arkansas State University and the founding executive director of the Delta Population Health Institute. As a leader of the institution, Dr. Laurent is a leader in driving health equity in population health and leads an innovation and advancement in medical education, professional development, and community engagement that leads to policy, system, and environmental ch or environment change. Dr. Jennifer Connor is a doctor of public health in leadership and policy and has over 18 years of experience bringing together people and organizations to achieve a better quality of life and quality of place in communities. Dr. Connor was instrumental in launching the Arkansas Coalition for Obesity Prevention and has achieved many policy, system, and environment changes along the southern U.S. Um, region to improve community resiliency. Dr. Connor has received numerous honors and awards at the local, state, and national level for building sustainable partnerships. In 2019, Dr. Connor was named the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health Leader Finalist and led her hometown of Lake Village, Arkansas in being named the RWJF Culture of Community Prize Finalist. That's amazing. Thank you both for joining us today. We're very excited to hear your discussion. Thank you, Dr. Rosenthal and Dr. Kafer, for this invitation. We are very grateful to the Center for the Study of Southern Culture giving us the opportunity to join you today. We have been looking forward to sharing our work in this presentation as we discuss how our bodies tell a story from the clinic into the community. Many of you are familiar with the power of storytelling. Arguably, what we walk away with depends on many things. A story isn't a story in and of itself. It's not stagnant, but it's very dynamic. And it's not dynamic just for the content of the story alone, but because the unnamed participants, namely the narrator and the listener, they too participate in the dynamic experience and the life of the story. And our presentation today is not about one story in particular. It's about how we've participated in these stories, about how we've learned how to listen to the stories of our bodies uh, through the respective disciplines, our respective disciplines, and how we respond to the stories we have heard. I myself as an osteopathic family medicine physician and Dr. Connor as a doctor of public health. For me, these stories started uh, in the examination room, but the power of these stories led me to understand that the health of my patients reflected the health of my communities, of their communities. And I want to share with you how osteopathic medicine taught me how to listen to the stories of our bodies. <clears throat> As an osteopathic family medicine physician, I've been given the privilege to take part of people's lives at times of great joy and at times of pain and loss and the vast human experiences in between. 
patients have shared their most vulnerable parts of themselves. And the weight of participating in this process has been both challenging and rewarding. The stories that I have learned in my practice has led me into some surprising places and has catalyzed the evolution of how I practice medicine. What I discuss, uh, what I will be discussing uh, today is how the tenets of osteopathic medicine has equipped me to hear the stories of our bodies. But first, I would like to share with you what osteopathic medicine is. There are two types of physicians in the US. There's a DO, the doctor of osteopathic medicine, and MD, allopathic doctors. Doctors of osteopathic medicine are board certified licensed physicians found in all medical specialties. You may not have noticed them at first glance, but they may be your emergency, room, emergency medicine doctor, your cardiologist, your anesthesiologist, orthopedic doctor, your internal medicine doctor, your ob gyn and many more. Not only do we learn medicine and the technological advances of medicine, but historically at the conception of osteopathic medicine, it was based on the whole person approach to both treatment and care. What's included in our med school curriculum is a specialized, tra a specialized training in the neuromusculoskeletal system, where in addition to learning medicine, we are trained to use our hands or manual medicine called osteopathic manipulative treatment and to treat uh, in addition to the latest advancement uh, to medical technologies. Osteopathic medicine has a very rich history, starting with its founder, A.T. Still, Andrew Taylor Still, who himself was a medical doctor in the 19th century. He pioneered the concept of wellness and recognized the importance of treating illnesses within the context of the whole body, specifically the neuromusculoskeletal system. Now today, that approach of medicine may seem implicit or perhaps common thought, but during that time, A.T. Still's approach was very much radical. A little bit of background on who he is, uh, he, his father was a physician and a Methodist preacher, a circuit preacher, so he traveled a lot as a child, um, and he was an apprentice to his father when his father was practicing medicine. He was also an abolitionist, and he joined the anti-slavery free star, um, starters and served in the Kansas Territory Legislature. In 1864, he served as a major in the Civil War for the Union. A.T. Still's path to being the founder of osteopathic medicine historically has been known to be forged from personal tragedy and his experience with medical care in his era. American medicine in the 1850s and the 1860s was generally characterized by poorly trained practitioners employing harsh therapies to combat diseases they understood insufficiently. Before the Civil War, there was a great majority of physicians who had not attended medical school. They had been trained either by apprenticeship or engaging in medicine without the benefit of any formal background. And common medical practices included the use of mercury, arsenic, purging, vomiting, blistering, and bleeding, and often left the patients much more weakened in their condition that led to their death. Uh, A.T. still was troubled um, um, by the, the death of his children uh, as well by these mechanisms because they too fell ill. And he doubted the traditional uh, methods of medicine, the use of medical drugs at that time. Um, pharmacology was not very advanced. Personally, in 1800s, an epidemic of spinal meningitis had swept through the area where his family lived and killed all three of his children. And it was said to be that those were the catalytic points in which he became disillusioned with modern practice of medicine during that time because of his grim experiences also as a Civil War doctor. This led still to reject most of what he had learned about medicine and to serve and to search for new and better methods. A.T. still never meant to start a new profession. Uh, he desired that in his days that medicine would evolve to adopt the discoveries of the human body and interconnectedness of the body's systems. A.T. still um, was an incredible anatomist. He did research on countless cadavers that led him to his discovery of the interconnectedness of the human body, which drives its function, the core basis of osteopathic medicine. He lived and practiced medicine among the Shawnee Indians. There is evidence that he was familiar with their healing traditions and even spoke their language. And it may have influenced the way that he practiced medicine as well. His exhaustive studies led him to discover the relationship between the neuromuscular skeletal system and the health and well-being of individuals. 
From that knowledge, he developed specific techniques of manual medicine, that's OMT, that encourage the body's self-healing uh, mechanisms. So now that you have the background on osteopathic medicine, I want to dive right into the core principles of osteopathic medicine established through the work of A.T. Still. These are the core four tenets of osteopathic medicine. Number one, the body is a unit. The person is a unit of the body, mind, and spirit. Number two, the body is capable of self-regulation, self-healing, and health maintenance. Number three, structure and function are reciprocally interrelated. Number four, rational treatment is based upon an understanding of the basic principles of the body's unity, self-regulation, and the interrelationship of structure and function. Now, when I started, I talked about the unnamed participants in the story, those who gave the story and those who were listening. And I want to take you a little bit early. I want to take you back early on in my lab sessions when I began my course in osteopathic medicine. And this is where I first learned how to really, really listen. We were taught to listen in three ways, with our ears, with our eyes, and with our hand. Our course taught us the concepts of listening to the stories that our patients shared directly with us but we had to do what we but we had to be more intently in tune to nonverbal cues we were taught how to pay attention to the way the patients walked when they walked down the hallway into the room how they transferred themselves in and out of the seat and onto the examination table we had to meticulously observe the facial affects of our patients looking for asymmetry and facial expression in the extremities of the muscles separated by the spine. We had to feel for the temperature changes between various parts of the body. Nothing observed was wasted. All served as clues to the functionality, the well-being, or the lack thereof of our patients. A meticulous structural exam by, ver by a visual observation can tell us if a person is at high risk for sleep apnea, if they're suffering from Parkinson's disease, or maybe autistic. But the third method of listening was the use of my hands. And in the beginning, this was incredibly hard. So we had to practice. We performed exercises in the class to practice how to listen in these distinct ways. We were instructed to palpate sponges that had small objects inside. We were instructed to uh, lay our hands on a stack of paper where there were coins hidden in between the pieces of paper so we would enhance our palpatory skills. That's our abilities to be able to feel abnormalities or normalities within the human bodies. This way, our hands will be very sensitized to the things that we, that we touch. We had to observe the body that we were treating, which at times were, were, was felt really awkward. Uh, we, were, we had to look at each other's bodies and faces for long periods of times and make note of anatomic points, variations. Looking at each other was so powerful and a vulnerable experience because our patients too were on the receiving end of our observation. So it was important for us to understand what our patients were experiencing as they were going through this process. It isn't until th this decade that the word mindfulness became mainstream, but we were taught these concepts of mindfulness uh, from the very beginning. And these are the, one of the core um, ingredients in osteopathic medicine to be, be able to provide care. So uh, we could appreciate these subtle nuances in the bodies that we laid our hands on. This was the foundation for me to learn how to listen to the stories of our bodies. As my skills in listening with my ears, eyes, and hands were growing as a budding physician, I began to greatly appreciate the first tenet of osteopathic medicine, the person seen as a unit, the body, mind, and spirit. And my observations through my new skills in listening affirmed this many times over. Over the years, there was significant amount of data on how common human experiences have directly affected our health outcomes. There is a story that is being told when we see our bodies responding to the mind-body-spirit connection. For example, in 2011, there was a publication on the perception of empathy in the therapeutic encounter um, that it had reduced the duration of the common cold. Uh, there have been further studies that have confirmed that there was a biological marker for the immune system called interleukins, the protein that's part of the process of fighting illnesses. It was found to be increased in patients who were experiencing empathy. That's right, a little tender loving care can actually go a very long way. Another study from the European Journal of Cardiovascular Medicine showed that isolation is an independent risk factor for a cardiovascular event. In other words, 
someone experiencing isolation over a period of time have a high likelihood of having a heart attack or a stroke. This risk factor is just as significant as exercise and nutrition. So if someone is experiencing a heart attack, it may not just be a clogged artery. There may be a story here about isolation and loneliness as well. A review of research conducted by Tiffany Field, the leader in the field of touch, found that preterm newborns who received just three 15-minute sessions of touch therapy each day for five to 10 minutes gained 47% more weight than the premature infants who received standard medical treatment. There are studies of showing that touch signals safety and trust and it soothes. Basic warm touch calms cardiovascular stress. Could it be that the story of a lack of development in some cases could be due to the lack of human touch? Perhaps you may have heard of an illness called tachycephal cardiomyopathy, also known as the broken heart syndrome. It's a weakening of the muscle of the heart due to severe emotional physical stress, thought to be due to the sudden surge of adrenaline in the body. It mimics a heart attack and a person has symptoms of heart failure. This illness demonstrates how emotional well-beings affect our physical bodies. So when we're ill, the cause may not be solely physiological. There are other things at play that is telling us the source of this story. Early in my medical career, I enthusiastically used my skills to try to make a difference in the lives of my patients. But I began to notice stark disparities in the health outcomes of my patients. I took a deeper dive and found that these disparities run deep and wide, specifically among groups who have been historically marginalized and discriminated against. For example, in this graph by the Kaiser Family Foundation, the infant mortality rate by race and ethnicity is significantly higher in people of color and indigenous people. Early on, I began to see that my abilities to listen and develop a medical plan with my patients was not enough in improving their mortality, their morbidity, their healthcare expenditures, their health status and their functional limitations. I began to see that there was a forces outside the examination room that had a greater influence on the health of my patients and even the care I wanted to provide. The stories of my patients' lives pointed me to these forces that were called social determinants of health, also called the factors that determine the conditions where we grow, live, learn, and play. These determinants of health include economic stability, neighborhood and physical environment, education, food security, community and social context, and the healthcare system. I remember a patient who was a store manager and also a single parent who I counted on a healthy lifestyle for her and her son who was uh, morbidly obese. Uh, the counseling included guidance on eating healthy and encouraging more physical activities. She shared with me she didn't feel comfortable allowing her son to play in the streets because of violence in their neighborhood. And the local Boys and Girls Club uh, was closed, so there wasn't a safe place for him to engage in some physical activities. Her son felt isolated, stayed home, and unfortunately began to engage in drug use over time. He dropped out of high school, um, thereby decreasing his chances for health and really a full life. This experience highlighted that at that moment, with the tools I had at hand, there was only so much that I can do to help my patients. The New England Journal of Medicine published research findings that found that healthcare contributes only 10% of health outcomes. That's right, all the work that we do in the clinics and the hospitals, in the examination room, only is 10, contributes 10% to the patient's outcome. All the other factors, such as social environmental health factors and individual behaviors and genetics, all these things were the ones that were mostly contributing uh, to, to the health outcomes of my patients. It also is important to note that behaviors don't happen in a vacuum, that the influences, uh, that, uh, that there are influences that must be accounted for that affects our behaviors. Policies in all sectors and public health efforts have to address ways to affect these external influences of our behaviors and health. In other words, our environment influences what we do and affects our health. You know, to further influence, to uh, further um, my understanding of the environment of my patients, I, have to, I studied maps of the regions where my patients lived and came from, such as this. This is a map showing the regions designated as the Mississippi Delta set by the Delta Regional Authority. That includes eight states and 252 counties and parishes. 
The Mississippi Delta is known to have the most arduous health challenges in the county. Delta states rank the lowest in the nation when it comes to health outcomes. The osteopathic philosophy reminded me to, to consider the interrelated relationship between structure and function and compels me to explore specifically in the structure of the Delta communities, what are they, these structures that may be contributing to the health outcomes of my patients. So I began to learn more about my patients who lived here and what the determinants of health were in these regions. So to see how we can better understand the stories of my patients. I began to study the maps that represent um, demographic, demographics of different people groups. This map presents the black population in Delta counties. The darkest hue of blue is where there is the highest population of black persons. Uh, the highest percentage of the counties, the highest percentage are found in the counties along the Mississippi River. The map, this map represents Latinx populations in Delta counties. The darkest hue of blue is where there is the highest populations of Latinx peoples. This map represents white population, the white population in the Delta counties. The darkest hue of blue is where there is the highest population of white persons, mostly found in Abu Hill in Missouri and Northeast Arkansas. As I looked at this map, the highest percentage of persons who were obese are in the same areas where there was a high percentage of black persons. The counties that have dark, the darkest hue of red is the region with the highest percentage of single parent families. The determinant of health, this is the determinant of health that is considered in this map. That determinant of health is the social and family no network, which plays a role in health outcomes. The counties that have the darkest hue of red here are the regions with the highest percentage of persons living in poverty. Again, the economic status is a, is a determinant of health where we see the highest percentage of chronic illnesses in these areas. I also began to discover studies that research common threads in each of these determinants that led to health disparities among people of color and indigenous people. The health disparities I observed in the health of my patients were also in these determinants of health. And the Kaiser Family Foundation points to studies that demonstrate how racism and discrimination is a common thread among the disparities in the social determinants of health, which is why we see disparities also in, in Black and Indigenous persons. In my assessment of health outcomes of my patient population and where they live, the third osteopathic tenant rings so true, and it's the interrelatedness between the structure and function. So as I listen to the bodies of my patients and dig deeper into the story of the data, the function of our bodies can never operate independently of its structure, not only of the systems within the body, but also the systems of its environment. Given this context, addressing health in the context of place is imperative to the pathway of healing and health. We must consider the determinant of health in the regions that we serve. We must also acknowledge how historical and present discrimination and racism has caused generational trauma and how past and current policies have reinforced the structural barriers to equal opportunities to obtain health. We also must address the, which assets and communities serve as a lever of resilience. The data I've been studying and the stories of my patients, both in, in, in experiences they have shared with me and their status of their health forged a pathway where I began to see how osteopathic principles could be applied not only in the context of the human body, but also in addressing the health of a community. I now will pass it to Dr. Jennifer Connor to talk about how she sees the stories in the examination room transitioning into, her communi into our communities. Thank you, Brooke. Um, <clears throat> so just as A.T. Uh, A. Steele's third osteopathic tendant, um, highlighted that the body and structure and function are interrelated. Um, in community health practice, the community structure and function are also interrelated. Each of the concentric circles of the socio-ecological model, which is a commonly used public health framework shown here, represents interconnected structures that affect how the human body functions in both place and space. Public health practitioners are trained to approach health with this understanding that individuals have knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs that really influence their behavior and health outcomes. 
And moreover, we know that the family structure, peer networks, and social groups that we belong to um, also influence behavior and health outcomes. While the individual and interpersonal space factors are important, I think equally important are the place factors that influence our health and outcomes. Public health practitioners are trained to understand how organizational structures, community characteristics and culture, and really policy and regulation impact the health of a population. There's vast scientific evidence that has shown that built environments, such as our green space and the presence of sidewalks, correlates to the rates of physical activity among a community. And likewise, studies have shown that um, school programs and policies, mm, such as the National Breakfast Lunch Program, have reduced childhood food insecurity rates while increasing educational attainment. The best designed community interventions, much like the treatment plan in a clinical practice, address the mind, body, and spirit of the collective community and of the individuals that make up that community. So now I'd like to share with you one community story, but why this community and why this story? Well, every community has a story, but this one is important to me because I was able to witness firsthand the blended success of authentic community engagement, evidence-based public health practice, and really the passion among a unified community that desired to make long lasting change for their entire community. So the story begins in the city of Dermot, which is located in Chico County. This small Arkansas Delta community has about 2300 residents and really mimics most rural towns across America. While the ground is fertile and rich in agriculture, Almost two decades of declining population and a vacant downtown has really drained the community of tax dollars and resources. Loss of jobs and generational poverty have stricken the town, so much so that the median household income is around $18,000, one of the state's lowest, and 33% of individuals live in poverty. So by the numbers, Dermot has a high unemployment rate which was further exacerbated by COVID-19. This is a federally designated medically underserved area ranking 74 out of 75 counties in access to medical care. And that's also a disparity as we are in a pandemic. There's no public transportation and approximately 19 to 20% of families don't own a vehicle. It's unfortunate that the only grocery store in the town closed many years ago and the nearest one is about 12 miles away. So by the numbers, Chico County also ranks among the worst for health behaviors and health outcomes. They have really high rates of adult obesity, childhood obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and sadly, cardiovascular mortality and stroke mortality are a major issue for Dermont. Now, if the narrative ended with just these numbers, it would be a grim narrative but also a very common narrative among many of the Delta communities. But luckily the narrative doesn't stop at just the numbers. In fact, there's a narrative to be told about the resiliency of many Delta communities who are working to revitalize their downtowns, work to make jobs, foster innovative solutions, and create inclusive policies. So now I'm gonna just continue on with the good narrative of Dermont. Evidence has shown that communities are most successful in generating sustainable change when there is a desire, when there is resources, and great leadership. In 2014, the concerned citizens of Dermot came together about health and welfare of their community. They had crumbling infrastructure, vacant storefronts, absentee landlords, lack of nutritious foods, domestic violence, and lack of programs for their youth. At the time, the Dermot School District was also at risk for being taken over by the State Department of Education. But honestly, despite all of these challenges, the community had a significant desire to do something. After months of community meetings and planning and technical assistance from various agencies, the local leadership developed and launched a community health improvement campaign called Healing Hearts. That's healthy eating, active living to improve neighborhoods and growth. 
You can see here that Mayor Gray and Judge Ball are signing a city resolution and they made a public commitment to the projects in this initiative. While this accomplishment is really a highlight of their story, the deep meaning of the campaign logo and the authenticity of how it was derived make this story and policy accomplishment even greater. The heart and the logo was chosen to signify the efforts being done to improve chronic disease, especially heart disease in this community. But the heart is also symbolic and cultural of the South. We often are heard saying, bless your heart, or describing Southern hospitality as one with heart and soul. The word healing in the logo is also representative of the need again for healthy eating and active living, but it really went, went further and deeper and it had a meaning to the community levels. There was a need for healing. Many Delta communities are in a continuous state of healing and that can be from structural racism to flooding and other natural disasters to social isolation. Healing both at the individual level and the community level is an important step in building resiliency. The community took an active role in launching several place-based projects and by design really worked across the socio-ecological model that I presented earlier. Before the launch of their initiative, community members spent considerable time reviewing and gathering data and really took time to understand the strengths and challenges with state and federal data. They then worked to triangulate that federal and state data through a local needs assessment, which was critical to the process. As Dr. Laurent mentioned, osteopathic daughter, doctors are trained to listen with their eyes, ears, and hands. And similarly, public health practitioners are listening with their eyes, ears, and hands and they have to guide communities to listen to each other with their eyes, ears, and hands. Ground sourcing is a key task that I must do to ensure the community is ready, willing, and able to make change. It's not enough for me to just go into the community once or twice and then suggest ways to make it better. The reality is I often spend six to eight months with the community before we embark on crucial tasks because trust has to be earned and transparency must be evident. I'm often asked what a doctor of public health does and kind of where is my clinic? Well, my patients are the citizens and my clinic is the community because every citizen is a patient. They all deserve and need health and wellness. As a practitioner, it's my job to assist communities in designing and implementing interventions that improve quality of life for everyone. Just as a medical doctor tailors their treatment to make sure they meet the needs of their patients, well, we tailor programs, policies, and prevention efforts to meet the unique need of every community. So as for Dermot, we tailored their interventions across the clinical sector, the faith-based sector, the education sector, and the municipal sector. Some of our efforts are shown here and they include planting a garden at the library and implementing a Know Your Numbers health literacy campaign. We also created a worksite wellness program in the Dermot School District, which is one of the major employers in the area. That included making learning beds in the garden, an employee health and wellness screening and education session, and a safe routes to school program that added new sidewalks for kids to get to school, and an after school mentoring program, which was a major need. We also developed health ministries at several local churches, which included free exercise classes, free cooking demos, and free blood pressure checks. We know that churches are important to the community of Dermont. We also added a health fair at the annual crawfish festival because everyone goes to the crawfish festival in Dermont. And lastly, we launched a free community-wide physical activity program called the Mayor's Strut and Stroll. This was a one mile walk that was led by the mayor, allowing interaction with the residents, but it was especially targeted to moms and children with strollers to be active. So I'm often asked, does all of this community work matter? And yes, it does. The, um, the answer is yes. Let me share a story of how pictures and a whiteboard let the citizens of Dermot to understand the reality of their world along with the barriers and successes. The technique is important for a couple of reasons. 
The first is the photography project allowed the Dermot residents to reflect and celebrate their small wins and to learn about their areas of improvement, but also to become a self-advocate for change. And second, it provided the opportunity for our team to gain deep insight about the community that just can't be captured in surveys or chart reviews or network analysis. So now I want to tell you about the woman in the picture. This woman is a cafeteria worker at the Dermot School District. She was an active participant in our worksite wellness program and came to many of our health screenings and our education sessions. In her early years of screening, we found a high glucose reading. We worked with the school nurse and the federally qualified health center about two blocks away so she could seek care and become under the direction of a, a physician. She was started on metformin and started making lifestyle changes to support her new diagnosis. She was so excited to report to us that she started walking on those very school grounds every day after school with her daughter and grandkids who were also enjoying the experience. Um, in the following screenings, we found a high cholesterol reading for her. Once again, we worked with a school nurse and the clinic up the road and she sought care and began working with her physician on dietary changes. I love in her own words here, she says, I've gotten my sugar in a good range and I've been uh, screened at work and I'm going to the doctor. In a short time of six months, she made that appointment about her cholesterol. And I love her motivation to make healthy behavior. She says, I want to keep my eyesight and not lose a limb and see my grandkids. The second osteopathic tenet indicates the body's capacity to self-regulate self-heal and maintain health. Now through our community-based programs and policies um, and the resiliency of the human body, this Dermot cafeteria worker was able to improve her overall health and well-being. And in parallel to that, through community-based programs and policies, communities also have the ability to self-regulate and self-heal through our interventions. And they have people, resources, and assets that allow them to improve their culture of health. Ultimately, working across all those levels of the socio-ecological model and really tailoring our work is aimed at building a culture of health. The program and policies in Dermont, at the library, the school, the church, and with the city government were all designed to foster collaboration, generate that community buy-in that is needed, and to be inclusive. When these were achieved, um, or when these are achieved, we often see like this shift in mindset over time and that moves communities towards a better culture of health. But fundamentally, that takes breaking down silos, pulling together resources, and realizing the interconnectedness of our work between public health and community health, community and economic de development, and clinical practice. Practitioners in each of these three dis disciplines can be strategic in how we approach community improvement. Just some of the examples that we've had are prescription for exercise programs where doctors were advocates for sidewalks and worked with the city to put them in, and public health practitioners built health education and walking clubs around that program. Another example is the repurpose of a burned out building on a main street that was used to create a pocket park where kids and adults could come and play games and enjoy healthy food. And lastly, we have examples of launching a commercial kitchen to create access for healthier food retail options. So as a community really starts to see a shift in their culture of health, we can also see an increase in community resiliency. When silos are brought down, we see that innovation really flourishes. When public health, economic develop developers, and healthcare professionals come together to the table, we see more robust cross-cutting projects that really move a community forward. After many years of practice, I developed the HEAT model that you see here. When we authentically engage with communities and we consider health and healthcare, education and environment, arts and agriculture, and transportation and tourism, we can really see communities take a uh, take away the need for resiliency and move forward in their work. So with the HEAT model, we provide technical assistance 
that shows ways that they can engage all of these sectors across the socioecologic model and make real sustainable change. Thank you, Dr. Connor. You know, it wasn't a surprise to see the merging of these three crises during the COVID-19 pandemic, a public health crisis, the racial injustice crisis, and the economic crisis. Like some, we too knew the disparities in health outcomes before the pandemic. Uh, they were drastic. The severity of the courses of this illnesses were going to be uh, mostly affected by vulnerable populations, people in rural areas, and people of color and indigenous people. The vulnerabilities also is not only seen in the context of race, but also in geographical disparities where regional, uh, where rural regions in the Delta that lack connectivity was a roadblock to gain access to telemedicine or children being able to continue their learning through a virtual curriculum as school could not assure a safe learning environment or small businesses that do not have online platforms that are struggling to survive because of the economic implications of the pandemic. The public health system uh, hasn't been able to meet the demands of the pandemic with adequate testing, comprehensive contact tracing, or access to healthcare. And as practitioners in this moment, albeit unprecedented, it is all too familiar for the vulnerable communities that we've been working alongside with. So let's go back to the osteopathic tenants. After we consider how interconnected not only the systems of our bodies are, but how are interconnected we are with our community and our env environment, and that structure and function are interrelated, as well as understanding the assets within our community that can serve as key ingredients for healing. The philosophy of osteopathy would suggest that the intervention to transform health of our bodies and of our communities is based on our three tenets, especially in the innovative examples that Dr. Connor has demonstrated by bringing these precepts in the context of a community. This is the foundation of our institution, the Delta Population Health Institute. It was established to address health in its broadest terms because health starts with the conditions where we live, learn, grow, age, work and play. And the intervention to transform health has to begin in these places. When we create solutions to address the determinants of health and apply health in all policies, or this approach, and invite every stakeholder in the community to apply a health lens in their industry, we will begin to hear a new narrative and a new story for our bodies. I will leave you with one of my favorite quotes um, by A.T. Still. And it states, to find health should be the object of a doctor. Anyone can find disease. For us, the work of health, both in the human body and in community, can be overwhelming because it's complex and it's painful to see people suffer, especially when it's preventable. However, within almost every situation, whether within this individual body or within community, there are points of health. There are signals of resiliency that are necessary ingredients to innovation in creating a culture of health. And as practitioners, these signals of resiliency is necessary to adequately respond to the stories of our bodies. Thank you.